Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. Yeah, it was like, it was the Baza. Yeah. And I was like trying to find our team. And I was like kind of looking through these rooms. And all of a sudden, I come to this room and there's this, like a single file line of like 20 dudes. And what they're doing is like one guy is they would go and run full speed and jump off like a like a gymnastics, like little trampoline thing and then just go like somersault into a wall. And I was like, oh, that's got to be like the gymnastics team. And then I look and like Chris Bork was on the team and he's like, yeah, it's us. And I just had to get in line. And that was the first thing I did. I had to run full speed and just jump into this wall. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, and I was malicious, and I don't care. <laughs> I'm alive. He's a freaking madman. Look at him going to town. Cool. Well, welcome uh, to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Brent. Awesome that you could. Um, it's funny, you know, we're always looking to get guests on, right? And it's, it's one of the – can be difficult at times. So yeah. one day – I was on Instagram and I saw Brent Sobel on there. Shit, Brent played with the Habs, um, played in the NHL, obviously. Um, and I said, I'm going to give it a shot. So we reached out and I looked at some of your uh, stuff on social media. And I listened to you talk about some different things. Your foundation, you started the Brent Sobel Foundation, uh, has yeah. to do with d- dyslexia. Uh, yeah. You were dyslexic. Um and I wanted to get to this, like, if you knew this, you found out when you were 32, right? So yeah. 32 years old. If you yeah. knew this before, when you were, say, a younger kid, do you think the trajectory of your life or career could have been different in some ways? Oh, are we are we women? Are we going to play the what-if game? We can do that all day long. Um <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, you know, it's funny, you know, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, Stapes is, you know, it's going to make sense. He, you know, him and I played together and he saw how completely fucking whacked out of my mind I was. And after I got sober, you know, that's when it all connected um, to what I was doing and why. And uh, to that question is, yeah, absolutely, you know. Yeah. Now, now you know, right. being dyslexic, I look so different. You know, I, I I operate so differently. My brain's wired so differently. Um, I always had to work harder than anybody because I was told I was dumb, stupid, and lazy my whole life. And, yeah. and you know, it's just my brain being wired so differently. For example, like when I'm driving on the highway home, I'll tell you every license plate on every car, truck that I drive by or drive by me. People are like, why are you looking at there? I'm not, that's just how my brain, you know, my brain wires um, completely differently. So it's, and Stapes, you know, I used to have the most whacked out rituals. Like I never took a pregame nap. I'd go, you know, for a day. Did go, you ever sleep? Like I no. just remember like you've never slept. <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> it was yeah, and funny, you know, and the rituals I had to be, just stupid fucking doing cartwheels. They, the rookies always used to make fun of me at the rookie party. That was the that was the joke. But Stapes, that was my ADHD and my dyslexia. Those rituals was keeping my life together without I, without even me knowing. Now I can look back and why I did it? it was all that. And I didn't nap because I wanted to be tired. The more tired I was when I walked into the rink, the less my dyslexia and my ADHD worked. And I could just play and not think. As soon as I th- started thinking, I was done. So would it be safe to say we had a guy on here, former NHL, Colin Wilson, who was OCD. And he said there were times that he felt he was like, you ever see a cat in the corner or an animal that's oh, scared yeah. to death in the corner? He said, that's what I felt like a lot of the time. Was, was that similar with you? <laughs> Well, you know, Saves can, you know, uh, uh, you know, talk to this a little bit too from his side of it. Like, I'm a weird fuck. Fuck Saves. I want to hear it from you. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm as weird as you're going to get. Um, you know, Kobe Bryant's dyslexic. Yeah. You know, if you take a look at Kobe, nobody, Kobe didn't have friends. That's why he worked harder. But, you know, see, you know, he's just, 
we're wired differently and it's Dave's, you know, you can talk to it and you know, I can tie it all together, probably the best at any point in time. Cause we play together how different that I was, you know, compared to, you know, those rituals are just stupid. So yeah, they say, yeah. no, yeah. I was going to say like when I saw you after practice, just taking, you know, slap shots and blocking shots, I thought that was weird, you know, cause I, I never done that in my career. <laughs> well, so. just cause I didn't <laughs> have your skill. Ahead, no. like, come on. You know, if I had your skill, <laughs> yeah, I was no. still playing. Fuck. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they say in life, if you can count your friends on one hand, you're damn lucky. Yeah. So you said in your NHL career, you never had any friends. You just had acquaintances. Is Stapes a friend or is he an acquaintance? <laughs> he didn't want to be friends with me. He was like, this guy's completely, I was fucking mind. I can't keep up. I love you, Soaps. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, I loved you because I know you're just joking, but go ahead. It's just, it was, I didn't connect with anybody. Like, and I didn't know who I was, you know, to be fair, you know, I, I know who I am now. I mean, you know, I had to get sober. Um, I started the foundation. I didn't want, I never want a kid to feel the way I do every day. You know, I was reading a grade four level in high school. So I didn't know what all that meant, you know, till I got sober. You know, I'm lucky I'm alive with the shit I did, you know, with the drugs and alcohol, but that was just, I, I ran from one, you know, one thing to the next. And, you know, my defense mechanisms was those routines, the drinking, the drugs. Um, so to be fair, I didn't even know who I was. I get that question. Who's your best coach? I'm like, doesn't that nobody, because I didn't know who I was till I got sober and was able to understand what, what that well, really all meant. I don't know. I guess that's old age. I should say maybe. When you first found out about being dyslexic, like that first time you kind of found out, was that like, what was that? Was that just like an immediate relief or was it kind of like took you time to understand that? Like, how did that feel? So I was 32. Um, how I found out, we got my daughter tested. And when we went back in for the results, so they got, you know, dyslexic, dysgraphia, decalcula, ADHD. And like, huh. so that's, that's when we started connecting the dots. And I didn't, didn't, there was no relief. I just put my focus into her. Because I was still playing, didn't you know the reading, writing, didn't need to worry about that. You know, just I just need to worry about eating pucks. So it was just, but that was really the first time I've even really heard the word. I, mean, I didn't know what it was. Uh -huh. You know, so it's taken me a lot of time to dive into her, make sure she got the help, and and learn more and more about what that is. And obviously, where where I am today with it is completely different. But, you know, it, it got me to where I was because I walked higher than anybody. I saw the game differently. Um, being dyslexic is not 100% um, is why I made it. But, you know, it's also why I hate the game too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> listen, I'll fight anybody. I don't give a fuck who they are, how big they are, their reputation. But get me to block a fucking shot. See you later. <laughs> And you fucking said it, eating pucks. Like, I Dude. fucking hated getting hit with a oh, puck. Oh, I used to do, like, the. I used to know I wasn't in the lane and just go oh. diving. Like, it would make it look like a, I was trying to block. He was a perfect guy. That it was just, it happened to be that far out of the lane. You know, he worked on being out of the lane in practice. He wanted it to get to you. He he was being he was being uh, nice there. He was sharing. And if I did block a shot, it would hit me like in the middle of my back or something. I would just be like, it would just be like oh. the worst form ever. You know, oh. so. so you're drafted um, by the Canucks. You go to um, uh, Vancouver, that first training camp. Was was it um, – I, I remember my first camp. I always think back to how I was when I came there. How was that for you? And, and you know, getting out of junior, having a good junior career, swift current. And you go to Vancouver that first time, the show, were, were you intimidated? Was it? Oh, did, dude, you know, you know, you know, and there wasn't one day in my career that I thought I made it. No. There never, never, not one day. So I was intimidated all the time. I was looking over my shoulder all the time um, because that's, I, I didn't have the belief in myself, you know, I had a lot of emotions. I was a fucking roller coaster. Um, so I never had any, any belief I could, you know, when I was on a roll, I was on a roll. But when I was down, I was down. 
and um, I just had no confidence. Uh, yeah, I was deer in headlights walking in training camp, like coming on a swift current um, to, you know, Alan Lars McGillney, you know, uh, Messier was there later on, you know, the, Trevor Linden, Kirk McLean, you know, those legends. Uh, I'm like, what am I doing here? Why, why am I here? You know, and can't believe I'm here. And why well, am I? It couldn't I? have helped. It couldn't have helped with um, what a cocksucker Mark Crawford is saying that you'd never play in the NHL. I mean, the, to drive you, but I, I understand your disdain for coaches now, but you know, here you are in your first NHL camp and this fucking guy telling you you'll never play in the fucking NHL. Was that mind games you think, or did he really think that? No, you know what? I think he was, he was, you know, back in the day, you know, that was mind games. They like, they were the boss. Yeah. And they had to get the most out of you. However that was. And they were, they didn't care about feelings. There was no feelings. They didn't give a rat's ass. And I think like when, after I got called up, you know, he played me like I played probably four or 500 games underneath him. Like as much as we had love, hate, he, he played me, you know, I was, you know, some of those playoffs around, I was playing 25 minutes. You know, I had skill at once upon a time on the power play. Um, so he had to have some belief in me, but I think that was the old school uh, mentality, uh, you know, hard nose, you know, in your face. But I take those things differently because of what well, my struggles. I always say dyslexics, we hurt longer, harder, and deeper than anybody because we're born with our right brains wired. So when we grab that book at a year old, we're already struggling. So now I, I can look back and make yes. sense of it now. Yeah, and it sounds like too, it, it, you know, like it's like almost like you had, you didn't know, like you didn't have like an identity for yourself almost, right? Like you didn't know. Did you ever try to address it though? Like in, during your career, like uh, talk, like just kind of talk to somebody about it? No, you guys know how it is. We're not on talk. We're not going to think about the end. Yeah, yeah. We're going to play forever. Yeah, yeah. And the internal pain and the fear of the real world was so great for me that I had no problem eating, fucking eating pox all day long because that, was, that didn't hurt. The fear that I had of the real world, you know, learning disorders, no education, no nothing to go out there. Um, I would have done that all day long. So saves, I didn't, I couldn't look at it. I didn't really even know how to look at it. I knew one way is put my head down and just keep, you know, keep going to the, you know, to the end. And I'm telling you, seven years, last seven years have been fucking hard. Seven years of my life. That's for sure. This real world suck. Uh, well, Vancouver, like your last year there, I mean, you had great fucking numbers, 10 goals, 32 yeah. assists, and then you end up in the island the following year. Like, did you have a falling out with a coach? or the, What happened there? Because well, fucking, for a that defenseman, was a for cap. a demon that eats pucks, has those numbers, you'd be yeah. fucking crazy was, to let the guy go. Yeah, so well, that's when the salary cap came in that year, oh, okay. four or five after the lockout. Yeah. So I was a salary cap casualty. Um, I guess Merrick Malik – and myself, and you know, I was a couch city going to the Islanders with Mike, with the retired Mike Milbury. Um, <laughs> you know, and that shenanigans. Um, so that, you know, Vancouver, you know, I played, things were great there, but again, I was a cap casualty. That's when the game started changing, you know, no red line. You know, I was in, I was always rated the slowest and ugliest in the league, so this, opening up the red line didn't really help with my <laughs> slow ass. So, <laughs> game started changing, and um, I was in the island for a short period of time. I told Milbury to have a have a nice day, and uh, you know, and you end I, up in L.A. Yeah, How after he LA? after he lied to the yeah. L.A. Kings, he traded me in a lie. Um, Wasn't Crawford in L.A. too? <laughs> yeah. I played, so like, that a coincidence I, I played or? like 400 games, 500 games with Crawford in Vancouver, then, uh, you know, then in LA. Wow. Yeah. So it's, so he, yeah. Must've liked, he must've liked you deep yeah. down inside, I think. Right. I don't know the, the love hate relationship or, um, he was, he got me going the right way. Like if my wires crossed, then it was, then I could, you know, I was good. And that's what he knew he had to do. And it got ugly. 
you know, now if any of the coaches did that to the NHL, the guys would be in the corner sucking or something, oh. crying like they're a bunch of babies now. Um, yeah. But, you know, he, he, he figured out how to get to me quickly. And um, it fucking hurt because I didn't really know what it all meant till you know, after hockey. Yeah, until you, um, and obviously, because Tim and I certainly can speak from experience, when you get sober, you do find out who you are. Um, that's for sure. And um, when you dilute yourself with drugs and alcohol, uh, it oh. certainly doesn't help. No Those one's drugs are, are so awesome, so. though. I love them so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so don't get us wrong. There was a lot of fun times, you know? <laughs> so, Stapes, I got to have so, you know, sober sex, sober golf the rest of my life. Come on. What's this? <laughs> oh. Oh God! I have, yeah. that, you got me on that one. I'm fucking tongue tied now. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I and I talk about the, the love, loving the drugs. I did because it took away my pain. Yeah, you know, exactly. and I would go on. I was buying my bags of ecstasy and Molly and stuff, hundred at a time, and I'd be up for three, four days. Um, how the fuck? How the fuck did you play? Well, you had to have that in you to play. Fuck, well, right? You know, well, this was I after, right? Stuff. I, my drugs were hard after, um, really hard after. I was always drinking. I was always a part of it. You know, play guilty. Some of my best games. <laughs> but the the game hit me hard after um, I hit the drugs very hard. Uh, you know, you know, got divorced. You know, lost, lost all that. You know, I always say when I'm counseling people, trying to get guys to have two identities and what I mean by that is guys identities usually wrapped in their job yeah. and you lose that identity or that purpose you've got nothing it doesn't matter how much money you have you don't have a purpose to get up you don't you, you have nothing and I was told where to be and when to be and how to be for 40 years and now I got nothing now everybody said who's going to be there is gone nobody hire me nobody you know I sold my Stanley Cup ring at one point in time. Um, it was just, you know, yeah. it was uh, it was some dark times. Yeah, I guess, and we've certainly been through them ourselves, Tim and I. Um, but you know, everybody has their own story, and you know that pain certainly when you numb it. Uh, and I did it for years myself, and um, then you 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 got to come to and wake up and. And, and grow up basically and, and not something that's easy to do but it's well worth it once you know you, you get honest with yourself your time in Chicago um it seemed like certainly a Chicago original six blue collar city they love fucking guys like you they love their stars but they love guys like you you win a Stanley Cup there um coach Q there a lot of people love this guy we just had um um, Shaw. Shaw on, and mm -hmm. he just spoke glowingly about Quenville. But winning that Stanley Cup, yeah, like for you, talking about the difficulties you had, how was that? In, I mean, come on, that's what we all play for. We want to win that. How enjoyable was that for you? Did you enjoy the moment? Did you? Yeah, uh, so uh, it was the most amazing, <laughs> awful feeling ever. You know, God. the internal pain that I had, you know, was – you know, it's indescribable, you know. So it was, like I said, I always say it was the most amazing, painful um, experience, time, whatever you want, um, for sure in my life. So you had acquaintances. You said not many friends on any teams. Like, did anybody come to you and try and not reel you in, but fucking be a friend to you? Listen, I had guys... I, I remember when I played in Boston, they put me with Vladimir Vrzyska. He couldn't speak any English. Yeah. They roomed me with him, right? Because they figured I could kind of communicate with him. Fuck, hello. And then another guy in New York, Igor Liba. He couldn't speak a lick of English. They put me with him because, okay, I'm going to try and make... And I, I actually enjoyed that. Yeah. I, for the fucking underdog, a guy that you know was trying to assimilate, try and get in with the group. Did anybody ever try and pull you in at no, all? Any and, teammates? No, and, and you know, and it's not their fault. 
I didn't know anything. You wouldn't let them. What, I, I wouldn't even know what that meant. Mm-hmm. You know, now I know what it means. I can connect all the dots. Um, you know, I counsel people. I work. What with does it mean? What does it mean then? Now that you know what it means. Well, you I'm know, curious. I offer. Uh, you know, obviously, I operate. My right brain's wired differently, so uh, I got an extra empathy chip. I, you know, I care a lot more. I feel a lot more. I'm able to connect dots in conversations. Um, I, I call it almost mind reading. I, you know, by how people say words, and I never understood what what all that meant until I got sober and understood who I was. I just, you know, everybody's got skills and strengths. Now I can see that. I just didn't know what that all meant. It was just, my life was a, a blender for 40 years till I got sober. So uh, of no fault of anybody. And then that's why I started the foundation. Most people don't even know what dyslexia is, you know? So guys don't talk about it. They wouldn't know what to approach uh, and what to approach. Even like, dude, you know, you're fucking weird. You know, that's how they approach yeah. me. And no, and no, and no, no fault to theirs because I was absolutely. Yeah, no soaps. I, I, no, I, I don't think anyone disliked you though, right? Like at least from my time, like everyone, you know what I mean? Like you, just, you were just you. And, and and yeah, like, I agree with you, Steve. So, right? You know, I was, you know, I was good with everybody. It was just, yes, I never connected because yes. I was, and that was, I didn't know who I was. So it's no, no fault to theirs. It was just. Like you are, you talk about roommates. I didn't have nobody want to room with me because I didn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you would just be standing there, just waiting. <laughs> yeah. No, I never, I never oh. took a pregame nap. Never. Like if I was yeah, home. And then you always like when we when we came home on a road wow. trip, you'd always go home too a lot, right? Back to Chicago at that time, yeah. at least when I was playing with you. Yeah, in Atlanta, we'd have Sundays off. I'd get on the six a.m. flight, go back to Chicago for twelve hours, see the kids, you know, fly back. Um, so you know, I, I was always on the move, but then he would be like the hardest working guy in practice. It was fucking, yeah. that's why it's like, this is soaps. Just let him be, you know, yeah. like it was, we did, you know, it was crazy. And that was it. So, you know, the, the craziest game, best games I had were, were hung over or flying cross country. Cause I was exhausted, and, you know, and that's what people don't get. You know, as soon as I think, as soon as I thought I was, I was toast. And then my mind would be going, you know, I couldn't react. So I wanted to be exhausted walking in the rink because then I could just relax and play. So you must have thought about this because uh, when you won the Stanley Cup, you uh, took the Stanley Cup uh, to the Gay Pride Parade. Now, Brian Burke, I know him. Well, I fished with him. I went to Afghanistan with him. I, I, I like Brian. Uh, he's a hot ass. He said the reason he marched in the parade, he said, and people would tell him, oh, you're a hero, you you know, macho guy doing this. And he said, I didn't do anything that a parent who loved their child wouldn't do. Why did you do it? Well, you know, obviously you talk about Perky. You know, Brendan, you know, his son came out, um, and it was, you know, in February of 2010, saying he, you know, he was gay. So he was the first one in the hockey community um, to come public with it. You know, we knew Brennan, you know, uh, in time in Vancouver, he'd be in Vancouver. He was always a stick boy, uh, we, you know, when we were in Boston. I called the, I'll call Berkey and got the, the green light from the family that I, I was taking there in honor of him. And, uh, you know, support him and um, support. That was awesome. You know, listen, I love everybody. I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. this world's tough enough. What's your What's your take on like what's been happening, like with like Provolov or whatever his name is in Philly, and guys just not supporting it or wearing the well, jersey? You know, I, again, I I don't I I have no problem with I, I don't care. You know, I enjoy it. I support them. Every I I just don't like how they're they're ramming it down. They're telling players what they have to do. You know. I was the first athlete ever. So you agree with what those play. guys did, right? Because yeah. they didn't want to do it. And I do too. If a guy doesn't feel he doesn't want to wear that jersey, yeah. I, I don't blame them for not. If, and no, I don't I, have that's a problem. Where I have a hard time someone wants to, Yeah. You know, again, Berkey, this is his son. That's why I started it. Listen, I, it, we all can support it in our own ways. Why do we have to? Yeah. 
why do we have to do it? And that's the worst thing that I really have a hard time with the hockey you know, world is if you don't fit in this little bucket, you, you don't exist. You can't. No. You can't exist. You, you, they make sure that you answer the questions this way. You've got to be this way. Well, come on. It's now 2023. Let guys support whoever, whatever they want, however they want. You know, the teams can do th- things off ice, you know, whatever they want. You know, the teams, can, if they want to support it, there's a way to do it. You know, and I don't think that closes it out. I think we're really closed-minded when we say, well, there's not everybody that likes everything. Nothing. No. Societies Nothing. like that kind of, you know, Correct. like, you, you, you know, you've, 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 right? Like, if it's like, uh, I don't know what I can use right now, but it's, you know, if I'm not out marching, you know, with Black Lives Matter, it doesn't mean I hate, you know, hate black yeah. people or, you know, I'm racist, right? Like, and that's yeah. what I feel like it happens. It's like, you got to do it this way or, or you're against it. And, and yeah, I just I, think that's fucked up. I agree completely. You know, why can't, I thought this country is supposed to be, you know, freedom of speech and, you know, have an opinion. Okay, great. But I just, NHL, you want it when it suits you or the world you want it suits you when it doesn't, you know, so it's, they want their cake and eat it, you know. I guess they're all women. So <laughs> you uh, saw some big changes over the course of your hockey career. And when you say changes, um, you know, you, the lockout, all that stuff happened. And when you look at the way the game was back then, and I don't want to say no more fucking what ifs from Knuckles. Okay, Brent? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. Um, but – uh, when you look at the game today compared to how the game was back when you played and you went through some of those changes and it started to change and go the other way, no red line, all that, cutting down on the fight and all this bullshit. What do you think of the game today when you look at the game and how much it's changed? You know, and I, I, I hate it. You know, you know, saves, you know back to, I, I, I cared about the team. I put myself, anybody's selfish people is where you lose me. And that's what the game is. There's just nothing but selfish. And why is that? Yeah. Why is that? Why, why is, when you call when you say that the game is selfish, I'm just curious. Why, why is it? So what does that mean? Yeah. What do you mean? By no, that? We would never, ever show up another team or opponents the way these guys love to do it. No, you got what's his face in Anaheim. Oh, Zegers. I would take a two hander <laughs> right to his teeth and love every second of it. <laughs> Great, you're skilled. I got no problem. Yeah, I, I can't do it. Great, but you love laughing in guys' face. You love showing people up, and that's what this game is about now: is showing up. It's guys like Bunton that you know that three game suspension, dude. Like back in the day. You would have got your teeth mocked in. You wouldn't be running around doing what you did. It was, I miss the, the battles and the, the war we went together. And there isn't, it's not there anymore. You know, like there's no respect, it seems like, right? None. Or are you just mad that you can't, are you just mad that you can't do the Michigan move? Is that, <laughs> you know, I coach hockey at my kids. If anybody tries the Michigan, they get kicked off the ice. <laughs> Do you want to do it in the driveway, a, right? Yeah. You want to do it, yeah. do it in the do driveway. It, yeah. I send my do kids out there. I said, he does somebody that's Michigan, go, you know, break his wrist. Like, well, why show up? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's where I have a hard time. You got, you know, everybody's dangling and it's stick handle through. And you got you know, your Marner, you got your 70 to go. You know, you got Carlson, San Jose. Great, you got 100, 102 points. He's one of the most selfish people. You would never get out. You probably wouldn't have had 70 points if he's on, you know, playing the right way. And, I just, you know, that, call me grandpa, call me old. Um, I'm just built, no. that, you know, that way. No, I just you like old that. school. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I got I no problem with the skill. I you guess you're right. I can't it. do it. I was off the glass and out. Now I got no, no problem with the skill. <laughs> just the don't glass. show people up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just don't you. show people up. And you make, make them look, at, look like an asshole. That's when I'm coming back at you. Yeah. I hear you. And there wasn't a lot of that, certainly, back in the day. Um, if you love your pet like I love my St. Bernard Adele, you'll want to feed them a balanced, biologically appropriate, raw diet. The reason I've chosen Formula Raw is because all blends of their food 
are locally sourced and they consist of exclusively human-grade meat and organs, as well as fruits and vegetables. And all products used are hormone and antibiotic-free. So like I said, if you love your pet like I love Adele, you choose Formula Raw. Make sure you go to FormulaRaw.com and use the promo code RAWNUX at checkout to receive 10% off your first order. That's RAWNUX, R-A-W-K-N-U-X. Your last stop in the NHL was in Montreal. Um, Did you like anything about Montreal? A lot of guys come here, they bitch about the taxes, this and that, the French, blah, blah, blah. But it was a short time, and look, I mean, you stuck out for me. This was my fir- was my first year back here. Um, you know, after I got sober, I came, I moved back here. I took a job in radio, but um, got fired because I wouldn't get vaccinated, and um, that's why I'm doing this now. But you had just come come to Montreal when I got here too, and you know, I saw you play. I saw you eat pucks. I saw a kid that fucking would do anything to win. And you only hear that short time. But what was it like that last stop in the NHL for you? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, talk about a couple of regional sixes to finish off in Montreal. The the history behind it, and I grew up watching, you know, Montreal Canadiens hockey night in Canada. Um, I remember, yeah. you know, I was Patrick Wall in my basement. It wasn't a finished basement, so I had my baseball glove on, my golf ball, and my stick. I yeah. take a slap shot at the wall. And I, you know, like an idiot, right? Then you say over, it. You know? yeah. yeah. I was going to say, you couldn't have been anybody but, but a goalie. <laughs> no, I, shot. So I was like, you I know? wasn't expecting like anyone. <laughs> so to come to, to Montreal, uh, the end of my career, you know, the French was tough because I can only speak Canadian. I don't speak American yet. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn it. You know, yeah. I'm going to mix in French too. Um <laughs> So it was, yeah, again, it's, it was obviously a great series. So you liked your time here? Yeah, 100%. Did you like your you know, time here? Yeah. yeah. 100%. You know, everywhere, everywhere's got great uh, memories, great stories. The yeah, Islander was, uh, you know, with Millbury is probably one of the worst. But, um, you know, I got traded at the deadline, you know, from Atlanta, which which I love too. Yeah. Um, you know, I was Samson. I packed, you know, packed my bags and wherever, wherever it was. <laughs> Where you went. Yeah, I'm I'm Canadian, so I was used to the taxes. So, <laughs> so you you uh, finish up in Montreal, your NHL career finished. Um, now a lot of guys don't think they're finished, and they want to play another year. I I wanted to play one more year, but I was done. And once I couldn't play it in Montreal, I got traded back, and well, I got picked up off of waivers, but I came back, and that was it. I didn't want to go anywhere else. I wanted to retire in Montreal Canadian. I did. Now, I had an opportunity to go to Bolzano in Italy and play, and I didn't want to drag my family over there. Why did you pick up and go to Russia? Did you feel you were finished? Or, or you, did you feel you were not finished with hockey and you, you still wanted to play? Or were there other reasons? So, you know, come full circle. Hockey was, wasn't a game to me. It was, it was a lifeline. Because I was the only thing I was good at. So that's where I got my self-esteem is being on that ice. That's where I could kind of escape. Yeah. So You felt you safe know, there. You felt mm, that's your you know, I knew I didn't have to do basically. a math problem across to cross the blue line or you know, had to read or you know. So I you know I kept playing. Yeah. I was gonna go wherever I had to go, you know, to continue to play it. There was no other option. Um I was too afraid of what what was on the other side. I never wanted to see that other side. So, um, yeah. So I had had some options. You know, I had a two year offer from Nashville, but um, and next year they're talking about the lockout again. Well, I lost two million dollars. Oh four oh five. You know, these yeah. guys got salaries. You know, now because I we sat a, a year. I lost a year of two million dollars. You know, they got what they got from us and they kicked us to the curb. I'm like, ah, you know, they might lock out again. So I took the deal in Russia and uh, went over there and um, showed my non-skill and, you know, kept playing as long as I could. I would, I played as long as I could to my body, you know, shut down. 
did you uh at that time where i can't remember was that like were you div- divorced then or going through it like was that one uh, of the reasons of going out there and trying to make money no i was i was uh i got divorced in the middle of my second year you know so i was going to russia to try and you know keep playing you know and make some extra money um I didn't, I didn't care where it was. It, you know, I enjoyed Russia, you know, all the other countries. Uh, I got to continue to play and that was my only focus. I, I could play, continue to play. Continue, that's the only thing. What is a at. guy like Brent? What is a guy like Brent Sopel's first reaction in Novo Kuznets? Nux, this place <laughs> is, I don't know. You might have been at the bottom of the chain oh, here. So <laughs> like, again, that's, you know, you talk a lot of guys you're going over there. You, the different mindset you had to have. Well, I, I only had one mindset. I was hockey. Yeah. Didn't matter where I was. It's, oh yeah, it was, uh, so Nova Kuznets is a five hour flight east of Moscow. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a dump. <laughs> like, so, so I grew up on a farm. Listen, I, I, like water. <laughs> I didn't care. I don't, I, you know, yeah. I didn't care. It didn't matter where I was. Didn't even, re- you know, say didn't even register. I'm like, uh, yeah. I can tell you stories, but a lot of guys can go over there. They don't have that right mindset because you're used to the NHL. It's it's different, you know. I I didn't have. I only had one mindset. That was hockey. Yeah. Well, listen. I went there to play in some old timer games. Fatisov had the Montreal yeah. Canadian team go over there, and I went over another time. The first time I went, I had fucking culture shock like crazy. Huh. I was like, fuck. You know, and honestly, gray was like red over there. Everybody wore black. Every fucking thing was black, black, black. I just had this culture shock when I was there. And, you know, I, I certainly, I got through it, no problem. What, what was it like for you away from the rink? And like Tim says, it wasn't such a nice place. I guess it wasn't. But how was that for you trying to fucking navigate your way around being dyslexic and, and, all of a sudden you're in this other country fucking in a shithole city. And that, what was that like? And that's a pe- you know, people that haven't been there. They have no idea what you're saying. None. No idea. No, no idea. idea. So now you talk about they, your, no your, idea. What, what, what you're talking about Russia, like, you know, oh, what, okay. what it was living was what you had to travel, like nothing. So you've got all these first round picks or guy, you know, guys coming from Russia, you know, these fans are, shitting on them you know they're struggling you have no idea where they came from like you can't even explain a lot of times in my stories people they thought i was lying because it is so far from (laughs) what we do over here so far i remember you go ahead no it's we can go on all day but go ahead no i was just gonna say i remember playing kazan i i flew into kazan it was my first day i get there and it was like, we were in the like morning. I was like, right when I got there, we were like in training. Right. And I was, we were in like this like building and I had to, and there was all these different Baza. rooms. And Yeah. It was like, it was the Baza. Yeah. And I was like trying to find our team. And I was like kind of looking through these rooms and all of a sudden I come to this room and there's this, like a single file line of like 20 dudes. And what they're doing is like one guy is they would go and run full speed and jump off like a, like a gymnastics, like little trampoline thing. And then just go like somersault into a wall. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's gotta be like a, the gymnastics team. And then I look and like Chris Bork who was on the team and he's like, yeah, it's us. And I just had to get in line. And that was the first thing I did. I had to run full speed and just jump into this wall. And that's the shit I'm talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, did you have anything like right away? That was just like, what the fuck is going on? Everything is two a days. Yo, know, we're gonna do a you know, five k <laughs> run. I'm like, listen, this this ain't a running body. What do you think? Like, <laughs> boom, boom, like holy, almost had a heart attack just to try and like, I I don't run. I can run a treadmill. I'm not, that's not what this. You know, it, they were quantity, not quality. Like you're on the ice yep. twice a day. Like you're doing this. Yeah. We're paying you, so you're gonna be here. You know that old mentality. Um, now, well, training camp was six weeks. We had a t-shirt. We survived training camp. <laughs> Tim Tim told me after his season ended one year, they had to they kept him around yeah. there to fucking practice at the end of the year. You're fucking kidding me? You yeah. had to do that, right? Co- soaps or no? Oh yeah. They they control you. You know, bat, you know, whatever you want, they've got your money. And you're gonna stay if you want your money. If yeah. you know, completely different. How about I the mean, Russian? We, yeah. 
How about the Russian gas? Did you have an, uh, any Russian gas? He still gas does like Russian did? gas. He oh. still does Russian I would, gas. If I could get my hands on it, I had my Right? Uh, like it was <laughs> the best. My trainer committed suicide on it. Was he the one gassing himself? Yeah. Wow. In the rink. What, your trainer over there from Russia? Yeah. No, he, he, he Russian gassed himself to death. Wow. Fuck. That's yeah, no, right. it's, that's Shit true. was great, it's though. True. Now, Tim, you guys, if you yeah, did, I don't, I mean, I don't judge him. Tim, if you did Russian gas today, would you consider yourself still sober? Uh, yeah. Fuck yeah. It, it, it's it's it, for recovery. The, it's what, for what, recovery. It, yeah, what the fuck is it? <laughs> what are you talking about? That's this what I like, want to know. Everyone should be doing Russian gas. Is yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> the, you mean yeah. the world would be a happier place? Yeah, it's all for... I don't know what it was, Soaps. I, I don't know. It was, it was for like jet lag or what. I mean, you might know more than I do, but I didn't know I did. What, what was your take I didn't on ask Russian questions. gas? No, I was, I was, I was <laughs> yeah. I'll take more, please. I'll take more. Can I have more? Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, we had guys on a team that would like try to get back in line with like a different shirt on, and the guy would be like, "Yeah," <laughs> like you know, like I don't know what was oh, in it. Man. It was it was magical. It was a unicorn. Um, yeah, I'd do it all day long if I could. You know, but it's it's gas. So we're, yeah, it's like whippets. It's over. Can you explain? <laughs> can you explain a story for me? Uh, back in 07, you missed a uh, game in the Stanley Cup playoffs. You hurt your oh. back picking up a cracker. How the fuck does that happen? I've had three hernia discs in my back for 30 years. You know, I played probably 75 NHL games with my back out of place, and you know, when it went out, it went out. It just you know, yeah, you know, turn the okay. wrong way doing what I did. And yeah, you know, I bent down to pick up a cracker and, you know, I bent down and went to the, went in the rink. Vigno was like, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll hold you out of game one. Like I got back problems too. So I understand turn around, walk right out, right to the media and told them, I'm like, fucking asshole. Like he's such a piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, that's what I did. But you know, my back I get that. I've time. done it. I've, I've done it. I moved the wrong way and pulled my fucking yep. back out. I couldn't even move. So I certainly understand that. I was just, when I read it, I mean, fuck, I've done that. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, Alan fans Mignon, had fun with it. Uh, you know, so, they thought I was a pussy, you know, yeah. you know, which I am. But, you know, when that thing goes, it goes. But you're not. But you're not. Um, so growing up in Alberta. Um, oh, no, hang on a second. It's God's country, Saskatchewan. No. Yeah. Oh, Saskatchewan. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Saskatchewan. Uh, I love the names. Uh, Porcupine Plain. Uh, good Soil. Uh, they got some great fucking names, Saskatchewan. Porcupine Plain's awesome. about an hour and a half from our farm. Yeah. So, Saskatchewan. Growing up, who, who, did you look up to NHL as certain guys? Who were your favorite players growing up? Did you? And you know what? It was for me, it was everyone. They were there. You know, so it wasn't one guy. It was like... They're there. They, they're all there. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously you watch Patrick Waugh, you know, Hockey Night in Canada, but it was, I was admiring them all because they were there. You know, not just, not just one. I don't remember. Yeah. Again, that's kind of how my brain was, you know, it was like, they're, they're all there. They're not, it didn't matter on skill level. I, it's just, I wanted to be there. You know, they were there. I wasn't. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about growing up as far as like locally, was there any players that like kind of were ahead of you? Like, but like it's around the same area where growing up. Yeah. Well, in Saskatoon, you know, obviously there's a lot of guys came through there. Um, you remember Rhett Warner? Yeah. Yeah. yeah him and I played, to, you know, played in the same area. Um, Pee Wee maybe they made a rule that him and I couldn't be on the same team. What? <laughs> Why is that? To, you know, because him and I playing with, you know, we nobody touched the puck. We'd win every, we'd every, you know, so they're trying to <laughs> see, you know, they try to make it fair for everybody, not like how they have hockey nowadays where they don't care. It's all about money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, back there, they split us up because they kind of want to make it fair and, and not have us dominate. How about um, playing in the NHL? Uh, and playing that role, you play block shots, kill penalties. Who 
Who was some of the toughest players to play against for you, to defend against? Peter Forsberg would light me up every night. I'd be on my ass, fucking yeah. taking the rafters, <laughs> you know, counter hits every time. And, you know, I played in Vancouver. I was on the, you know, I was playing during that, that Marty McCorley incident with Brashear. I played that game. The Steve Moore. Oh, you, oh okay. yeah. So I was yeah. playing there. So we had a lot of battles against Colorado. So, you know, Forsberg would just eat me alive. He, it was just, it was, didn't matter what he did. He was what? so strong. What did you think about that night yeah. uh, when McSorley uh, hit Brashear with the stick? What's your take on that whole thing? Well, you know, Brash, you know, Brash fought him twice. <laughs> you know, and we know Brash, how tough he was, how strong he was, you know. And yeah. being lefty, you know, he felt bad. So, you you know, yeah. you've been there. You know, how many times are you going to go? You know, if... Yeah, you know, Marty, if, de- well, Marty defends it by saying... You know, he want he should have gave me another fight. He, he fought him twice already, right? Correct. And, like, and beat him. You got to give him a back. third. You know, so yeah. Do yeah. I want you for a third? No, I'm trying to save you. And um, that was you know Brass's thought. You know, I already beat you twice, bad. You know, and and yeah, those are the rules. There was lo- there was next game. Yeah, there, listen here. Take the break. You know, I got you twice. All right, just take you know. So it's there was those things that was around back then, and, and that's what it was, and. We all know when those wires cross, you know, yeah. it's different. This, were you on the T? Were you there when that Bertuzzi and uh, Moore had thing happened? Yep, I was. What did you think of that? That was that was. What, what was your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, you know, a different, you know, a different time. You know, you know, Steve Moore, you elbowed Marcus Naslin in the head the game before, and. You know, we all in the media said we're coming after you. You know, you can't do that now. And that's payback time. You know, Nate, you know, Naslin was, ca- here's your captain. You know, guy was, guy was ridiculous. You know, he was our leader. And all right, you heard ours. Guess what? We're coming after you. And um, support, you know, again, things went south quickly. Again, same kind of thing that we just talked about with Orley. Listen, you know, he fought Cookie already. You know, yeah. Do, does he go again? And now we're now now we're talking. And, and Moore didn't answer the bell. Basically, you know, he, he fought. You know, he he should have. You should. You listen. You're talking about the captain. You know, and we had good yeah. teams. You know, we we finished first. You know, we had some good teams. Had some good players. And that's the way it was back then. Listen, you know, it was a hard nosed game, and you had to answer the bell, no matter who you are, when you are. If you did something, you had to answer it. That's just the way things worked back then. And you know, and he didn't to Bert and things kind of went south. Brent Sopel. What does Brent Sopel today say to Brent Sopel the eighteen year old Brent Sopel? What he knows now about the NHL, and what is your advice to that young Brent Sopel? You know, um, absolutely nothing, because I, I had to go through <laughs> okay. every one of these. I had to go through every one of these to get here today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And today, you know, counseling people in my documentary, um, having an impact in the world. I had to go through all those things to get here today. You know, that was my path. And you take me off that path, I don't get here. You know, so um, as hard as it is, as much as it hurt, but there's a reason why it all happened and it got me here. How, when you say counseling people, you uh, like kids, what, 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 do you have a program? Do you have a something set up where people come and see you on a regular basis or? You when know, you say counseling people, is it coaching? No, there's, there's, I got through a few foundation. Yeah. I, you know, through the foundation, you know, I speak at, at schools. Um, you know, I talk openly, uh, you know, if anybody needs help call, I will help anybody. I don't care who you are, what you are. You know, I started that foundation. I never want a kid to feel the way I do every day. And, you know, suicide been there. Um, I know how dark it is. 
So I'll put people in rehab. Yeah, you know, I work with people. Um, and that's the, that's the dyslexic side of me that I'm able to help connect dots and open, open doors to feelings and cleaning out closets, just, you know, different things. It's a different approach. And, um, I've been there and we all put our pants on the same way. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where you are. We're all struggling. We're all, you know, and I'm willing and we'll help anybody anywhere, anytime, any, and, you know, so my phone's always on. I get calls, you know, all the time, uh, foundation, dyslexia, mental health, suicide, drugs, alcohol. Um, kind so of book. that suicide piece, sorry, Brett, that, that mm-hmm. suicide piece and talking about it, you had suicide ideation and was that during your career, after your career? Um, after, after. And, and before you got sober and before mm-hmm. you got sober. No, no, it was, you know, our journey no. you know, being sober too. Um, you know, and, again, I, and how'd you deal with that? You know, some dark times. If you times. don't mind me asking. No, no, I, you know, um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, I'll sleep for a week straight. Sometimes, you know, I think the longest I didn't get out of bed, is, you know, seven weeks, um, eight weeks, you know, some dark, dark places. And, you know, I, that's why I say my phone's always on. I'll, I'll help anybody. Nobody reaches out. Like, oh, it's sad. You, you don't give a fuck. If you cared, you call. And, you know, that's the mental side, mental well, some, health side. Sometimes we don't know, right? Sometimes we don't know when someone's struggling, right? And, I, and no, I'm yeah, not I don't trying to defend you know, anybody I just have a problem anything. that nobody cares enough to, if you really care, and then you talk about the, you know, friends, you know, reach out you if you have you gotta you know everything the phone's gotta dial out too you know can't just dial in and you know been down there and yeah it's it's a dark place would you say the game today i know you don't like the game today but like do you like the fact though that it is okay to ask for help kind of today right like it's that that's kind of the new thing now the awareness i mean what's your thoughts on that that's a good I, thing, right? Yeah, I don't think it, I, I couldn't disagree more, you know. Um, first off, they they want to portray that. That, okay. that ain't the case. They don't follow through. Yeah, you gotcha. know, you, yeah. you, they all, you know, every team, or we care about family. No, they only give a fuck about us, right? And the problem with that I have with mental health is so many people lie about it mm. that... Explain what, that. You know, lie. Oh, you got when some you of the biggest lie. You got you know some of the biggest celebrities. You know, a guy in the golfer who racks his car, tried to kill himself. He had a sex addiction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He tried to kill himself. Be a man, right? So now your image, right? Like so, and there's so many people out there that have foundations that they're, they're making money off of. You know, have you been there or not? You know, um, have you been dark? Like everybody's got mental health. So what I mean is, are you truthful about it? Like I tell these stories so I don't resonate with somebody. And there's a lot of people that won't um, image money. You know, you talk about the mental health in, in the NHL. Um, you can go and get help. But what kind of help that is? Like you go to rehab, there's nobody to help you when you come back. They don't care. You know, you're a piece of meat to them. You know, they're not going to spend that time. They, they're they going to portray it, but they, they don't dive into it. Um, and I can tell you firsthand some ugly, ugly fucking shit that guys are making big money in the NHL, top pay guys that are mentally fucked. So what's, what's your advice for someone to try to get, because I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I feel like social media too, like everyone's an expert, right? Like everyone's, <laughs> everyone can relate. Everyone knows what's best for you and yeah. everyone, you're right. Like, and, and so what would you say, or what would be your advice that for someone to try to, I guess, get help, you know, cause it could be getting help. Could it could backfire. Like you could try get help with the wrong people that are just, you know, trigger you to like, just really want to isolate. Right. Well, and you know, and I'll explain that a little bit on my dyslexic mind is for like, if you're going to go to a counselor or a therapist, I always say you've got to go to somebody who's had your major trauma. So drugs and alcohol is trauma, childhood trauma. So if I'm sitting there and, you know, talking to Tim Stapleton, the counselor, 
If you're not dyslexic, you're going to have no fucking idea what I'm talking about. And I call it gaslighting. Now I just get pissed off. So are you going to the, going to the right place? Does, does that, any that make sense? Has anybody explained that, you know, to you? You can't go and everybody has every one of your traumas, but your major ones, you've got to have, that's why there's no such thing as bed, uh, bedside manner for doctors because they've never been in that bed. You know, you, um, I heard the expression before, um, suicide's a permanent um, fix for mm-hmm. a temporary problem. Now, depression, something that I had never experienced up until two years ago. I've never been depressed in my life. I had hangovers. I yeah. felt like shit, yeah. but I never had that dark depression. I was on prednisone for a, a, a mm-hmm. condition I had called polymyalgia rheumatica. And I came down off the prednisone too fast. too fast. And I was sitting one day and I'm fucking like, I mean, I've, I, I was in a fucking bad place. And Jamie, my girlfriend, said to me, hey, are you all right? I said, actually, no, I'm not. I'm fucking depressed. I don't know. Mm. I don't know what happened to me. And I realized it was a, the prednisone. And I'm so happy that that happened to me because mm. I was able to now understand when someone says, oh, I was depressed. Oh. Now I understand that feeling and what it is. I'm glad it didn't. I, I had it four days. Yeah. And, and that was enough for me. So I can certainly understand how somebody can get there. Oh, if, if all day long. To, that's something you deal with all the time, right? You know, yeah. I, I deal with mental health, psychosis, um, you know, and the problem is that if you haven't been there, you don't, you, you, you don't understand, you know, to that point, like now you understand. And you talk about the, the com- drug community, you know, opiates, benzoids. People have no idea what that means. They don't know the fuck gnarly to try and get off how you have to come off it. Oh, she'll put you in that spiral. Um, how quickly, what, no, what that all means, you know, ADHD, Adderall, Vivance, Ritalin, Concerta, those are all gateway drugs. Cause your brain doesn't, yeah. it dev- doesn't stop developing until you're 24. So if you're taking Adderall at a young enough age, a high enough dose, your brain might develop in a drug induced state. Then no, now you rely on, you know, on drugs. You know, I learned that the hard yeah. way, you know, with people in rehab. So it's all these little things when I talk uh, a big picture, you know, I got a lot of people that don't even know what the whole breakdown of ADHD is. You know, how you, how are you supposed to know who you are if you don't know a full breakdown of of what this is what you have mm-hmm. yeah yeah the depression in my own experience the, one of the hardest things about it because it just paralyzes you right and then it's like you get someone that might be like hey snap out of it oh, it's like snap yeah, yeah, out of it out like of fuck it. Yeah. you fuck like you. <laughs> you i know what's going on i don't want to be feeling like this that's get the thing is like i don't want to feel like this you think i want to feel like this and that's where it could be real easy just to feel, feel like no one understands and, and that's, that's where it can get dangerous, right? Like I've had everything happen to me and that's why I'm open to it. And that's why people re- you know, can reach out. Cause you know, my gnarliness of what's going on in my life is fucking endless. So I've been in all these situations. So I, I have the relatability is what I call it in all these instances. And would yeah, you say, to, would you say for sure through your experience? Cause I know through my experience, I know for a fact, I'm not alone. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I could think I am, but I'm not. Well, like, that's my tagline like and my foundation. You're not alone. Yeah. And that's yeah. when you're in the middle yeah. of a fucking battle, that's what you think you are and you're not. So that being said, when, when you go through tough times now and you struggle, do you have someone to go to? That you, that has been through that, that you talked about that. You got to talk to somebody who, Who's been through it? Do you have someone to go to? No, when you, um, you know, what I do is I counsel um, on all day. Like, you know, so I'm coaching hockey. I've started a program. It's called the Y program. Um, up in Hoffman States. Um, I need to know if your kid has mental health or learning disorders 
so that I can educate the coaches on how to coach your kid. Do you have ADHD? Do you have dyslexia? You know, m- mental health. What you know? Because if you don't have it, you don't understand it. Some dyslexics don't know the left from the right. You know, so I do these kind of things all day long. So I get my help from helping other people. So, yeah, I, and you talked about coaches, guys you work with, assistant coaches. I saw one of your videos, and you're pretty harsh on them um, in, in your assessment of the job they did. If you get into coaching kids, obviously, you got to be in it for the right reasons, right? You want to help these kids. You want to teach them. Um, and, and not just hockey, but life, too. Is that one of the things that bothered That's, you when I saw your, yeah. your uh, Instagram post on on those assistant coaches? Yeah, it, I was, it, it's about winning for them? Is it about winning for them? Was that it? Was that what yeah. kind of pissed you off? You know, here and here's yeah. where I'm And I understand. Point, you know... I'm coaching, you know, I got mites and squirts right now. When, you know, the kids are four, five, six, seven, eight years old. They're kids. Now, if they lose a game, is that going to impact their life forever? No. But what's going to impact their life is their self-esteem. So I base everything that I do yeah. in the foundation off self-esteem. Because dyslexia is basically no self-esteem. You know, I got kids on, you know, we struggle so hard that we, and we struggle. So everything to me, I coach off self-esteem and fun. Now, no matter who you are, if you're, if you're having fun and you feel good about what you're doing, you're going to, you're going to learn. Now, why do we have to have wins and losses and parents losing their mind at six years old? I'm like, coach, I got to go pee. I had three kids where I go pee in the middle of the game. The other. That's where we're at. <laughs> so I care about the mental health of every person I would come in contact with. And people do not see how bad people are struggling. And that's why everything I do is I, I coach off self-esteem is fun, never wins and losses. I develop, I don't coach for that foundation that you talked about so that they have that base forever. And you know, they, they can remember, they leave the rink smiling because I've, you know, all those kids getting yelled at, um, it sits with them. There's, there's a video, they say there's 40 million, uh, student athletes or, or kids playing sports right now in the, in the U S by the time they're 13, 70% quit. Wow. You know, wow. so that's a lot. What, what, you know, okay, why? Does it matter? They're, they're not having fun. They're not having fun. Parents. Yeah. Parents they're are not having asshole. fun. Parents. Oh. Parents are like, they think they're getting the scholarship. I mean, it's just like, I saw a TED talk that was about that, like how yeah. kids are quitting sports too early yeah. in life. No, that's and, him. And, and it shouldn't, you know. And that's why I, I know, got mad. And and it, it, they're all about winning. They don't care. Like, for an example, my, my mites and squirts, they come in one door, out the other. Number one, two, three, four, five. Why should we pigeonhole a kid at six yeah. years old? You're going to be center. They're kids. Let them be. Let kids. them play. You know, we got to grow yeah. up in an age where we could get on our bike and go riding and do oh. things. These kids can't. And that's to me is no is I'm like fucking hovering my kids. The mailman's here. <laughs> like fucking that, you know. <laughs> But that, you know, it's, like, it's, and that's sad. That's what, it's that's, hard. That's what it's, we live yeah. in right now. Yeah. And that's, so that's why I coach the way I do is off. Like I'm, I coach my t-shirt. I'm doing karaoke and I, I, I don't care. They're going to remember. And I'll give you an example. My, my Mike team this year at the end of the year, there's 10 kids. They did a little, their little paper for me. And it said, how did coach make you feel? Every single one of them said happy. I wasn't there. They did it on their own, away from, you know, at their own houses. You know, I had four, five, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds on my team. And every single kid made them happy. That's what I care about. How, how many children do you have, Brent? Of my, like, my own kids? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Four. Your own kids? Yeah. 
you have four kids. Yep. Now, they read up a little on dyslexia. They said it's a gene-based disease. It can be passed through the family. You said your daughter has it. Yep. Um, are your other children, do they struggle with it? One. Two, um, dyslexia. And, and I'm just curious, once you were diagnosed, do you ever get to the point where you can pick up a book and just read the book, no problem? I'm, I'm curious because, I, again, I'm ignorant of the fact that what you can do and you can't do with it, but it, it being a, they say reading the, it's a reading disability. Dyslexia is a result of individual differences in areas of the brain that process language. So that being said, like, could you, if someone has it, can they learn to read at some point? Yeah. No. So you never get rid of it. So we're born with a right brain wired differently. So you guys read with your left. We start reading our right and then cross over. So okay. um, can you do programs to enhance your reading? Absolutely. You know, that's why we want to get kids diagnosed at a young age. So they don't end up, you know, like me, not learning, finding out to your 32. Like my daughter found out, you know, in grade two. So you can learn um, science-based reading programs. It kind of teaches you how to reword the words. But... Dyslexia is one in five. It's hereditary. 50% of people in prison yeah. in the world is dyslexic. Wow. You know, you take a look at, you know, suicides have tripled in the last 10 years in teenagers. 90% of suicide notes have dyslexic tendencies. Wow. You know, uh -huh. 75% yeah. of us are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Because, you know, it's in our brain. So I, you get told you're dumb, stupid, and lazy. Like, we're just, our brains are wired differently. And a kid doesn't know. No. You know, so that's why it's the self-esteem is so important for me is because we struggle so much. So the littlest things for us, we take them to heart because, we, you know, we struggle. So that's why it's so important for me. And I talk about it openly is so people first off not understand what dyslexia is. Nobody does, you know, and, and that's why yeah. I started the foundation is trying to just have an open conversation with it. it. You know, yes, we learn differently. Okay, great. You know, I'm okay to know that now I teach these kids, listen, we all have strengths, we all have weaknesses. All right. We're going to turn left or turn right. We're going to work on both things. And we now I know that, you know, before I didn't know that. Well, have you um, ever crossed paths with like a, an ex NHL guy or current, you don't have to name names, but like, have you crossed paths with guys that, that have that? Yeah. You know, you, you do the math, you know, in NHL 700 guys, 20%. I can, you know, uh -huh. Derek Bugart. Just like, you know, I, you know, we can go down. There's a lot of correlations with a lot of things. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. Because all we know is hockey. And when you struggle at, at things, you hide from it. You know, so nobody talks about it. Um, so you, you're talking a lot, of, a lot of guys in the NHL have it. And then you want yeah. to know why guys struggle after the game because they're like me. Yeah. What do we do? I don't know. Well, do do. listen, Brent, I got to tell you, I'm, I appreciate you um, taking the time to join us today. One, two. I wish you all the best with your foundation uh, moving forward. And it's certainly admirable uh, what you do and giving back and helping other people. It is. And um, yeah, I appreciate having you. And I hope someday you and Tim can be friends. Yeah, I'm a friend. So <laughs> no, I was going to say so. So I appreciate you coming on. And I think in the beginning you said some, you know, something on the terms of like, you know, it's going to make sense and it, and it does, you know, it does. I think you're doing a hell of a job, man. Um, you're my friend, uh, but no, we keep in touch. It's always, yeah. it's always good to see you. No, I found my purpose. That's to help people, you know, and that's why you asked that question. What did I tell my younger self? Nothing. Cause I had to go through everything to get here and you know, all my craziness cool. makes sense now. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, always, you'll never forget me today. Some things. <laughs> <laughs> nope. There's only one Brent Sobel. That's for sure. Hey,
Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles Podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.